Hey, if you uh, run into Sandra at some point today or even later in the week, uh, just tell her congratulations and show your love and appreciation to her. We're celebrating uh, today, or acknowledging today, I guess better way to say it, uh, her um, uh, tenure here as, as being a member of the staff. Uh, she came on board here, I believe she started part-time in 2004, uh, went full-time in 2006 or seven. But she's been here serving all those years, and so uh, give her some love and, or some money, whatever you want to do. Um, let her know you appreciate uh, her, her ministry here uh, in the kingdom of God. Uh, this morning, there was a beautiful mosaic picture uh, in the 9 o'clock service. This middle section was probably about three-fourths filled with college students. There were some even to the side, and just wonderful to see a beautiful picture of our college students back in town, and, and many of them searching for a church home, and we're excited to, to be among the, the churches of which they're uh, prayerfully considering. And we pray that many of them will choose uh, to remain here. Grab your Bibles, if you would, and make your way to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. In this sermon series, A New Kind of King, we are looking through Scripture, particularly Luke chapters 19, 20, and 21, and we're seeing what Scripture has to say Really, we're looking more specifically at what Jesus has to say about himself. And we're learning that he is a, a new kind of king. There has been no king who's ever served in any capacity in, in all of history uh, that compares to Jesus, our king. Jesus, we've already seen this in days past, Jesus is a king who is truly humble. He has absolute authority, brings true peace, genuinely cares for his people, and demonstrates his authority. And we'll have some more we'll learn here in just a moment. But let me read our text this morning. Begin with verse 27. Scripture there says, Some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her. In the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise. For he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, Well said, teacher. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. Father, this is your word that we have now turned our attention to. It would be my heart's desire this morning that, that we would open our hearts and our minds that we would receive from you this morning, from your word, what it is you would have us to hear. Father, there's so much going on in our world today, indeed, even in our very own country. We need a, we don't need just a, a mere touch from you, Father. We need, we need your abiding presence to fill us. That we, each of us, would live, live our lives in such a way as to where this world sees who you are. That there's, there's no politician, there's no policy that's going to change the course of this country. Short of us returning back to you, submitting to your lordship over our lives, this country will continue to draw farther and farther away from you. And having said that, Father, we have to be honest this morning. We cannot expect the country to turn back to you 
when the country doesn't know you. But we, your, your disciples, your followers, we, we know you. And so, Father, we cry out, first of all, saying, we recognize we must return to you. We must allow you to be Lord over our lives, over our families, over our churches, our decisions, our thoughts and actions in such a way as to where the, the rest of the country can see that there really is an answer to our problem today. And his name is Jesus. He is a new kind of king. One that doesn't get caught up in party lines or certain agendas, but who has always from the very beginning and continues through today to be passionate about reaching the lost for your kingdom, redeeming mankind unto you. Speak to us this morning, Father. May we respond and in obedience, may we obey in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, just right up front, I want you to see very clearly that Jesus is a king who offers resurrected living. Jesus is a king who offers resurrected living. You could look back at the previous characteristics of, of Jesus and you could say there have been some kings in days past that might have fulfilled one or perhaps two of those, but nobody's fulfilled them all. But this is one that no king has ever been able to fulfill or ever will be able to. He is by himself in this particular category for sure. Now we know that early in this chapter, as we looked in the weeks past, the conservative Pharisees questioned Jesus on religious and civil authority. They were attempting to trap him, to discredit him, to cause the people to no longer listen to him. If they could get them to believe that he has no authority to be speaking and teaching in the temple, then the people would stop listening to him. And their questions, though, Jesus was able to silence them. And what we see in today's chapter, or these verses today, I should say, is that the Sadducees are taking their time. They're shot at Jesus. They're attempting now to trap him, to trick him, to expose him, or to cause the people to no longer want to listen to him anymore. The Sadducees, understand, were religious leaders who were considered to be experts in the law, particularly the, what they call the Torah. They only subscribed to the first five books of what we call the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They didn't accept any teachings from any other scripture or writings that were available outside of those five books. And they considered themselves to be very well adverse to them. And so they come to Jesus with this question, thinking they have him on something. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in life after Sadducees did not. And so they're asking this question, which is about resurrection, something they don't believe in, but they're thinking they can trap Jesus by bringing out this really weird or ridiculous scenario. You notice in verse 28 that it said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, and it goes on to describe the, the scenario. Now, what they're referring to here was is there was a custom during those days. The Leverite, Levite excuse me, uh, law uh, allowed for and even, even uh, in, uh, insisted uh, that an individual, if a, if a man was to die and he did not have any children, then his brother would then marry the widow in order for his widow to be able to bring children into this world. The purpose was to be able to extend the family line, but also to protect any family wealth that that man might have owned. Now, they bring out this idea that there was this one man who, who dies, and so his second brother marries the widow. He then dies, so the third brother marries the widow, and then he then dies, by that time, I'd be saying, I want to marry her. I mean, she's, 
I've already lost three brothers. I don't want to marry her, you know? It's a, it's, a, it's a ridiculous scenario, this idea of seven different brothers marrying the same woman of which neither of them are able to bring children into this world. And then she dies, she goes to heaven, and now the question is, well, whose wife will she be? And they just thought they had Jesus trapped. They thought they had him on the hook, so to say. But just like the Pharisees, they grossly underestimated who they were asking their question to. You notice in verse 34, Jesus' response to their ridiculous scenario is this. The people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die. For they are like angels. They are God's children since they are children of the resurrection. So first you'll notice that Jesus refers to two ages. There's the this age and what he refers to as that age. And he says that only those who are considered worthy will be able to take part in that age. Now well, the question could be asked, well, what does he mean by considered worthy? Well, let's think about it this way first. We didn't have any say-so in our interest into this world. Every one of us were born into this world, into a family. We didn't have a voice in the matter. But in that age, the next age, the eternal life, we do have something to say or something to do or input involved with it. You see, Paul, in speaking to the believers in Galatia, wrote, Now that a man is not, excuse me, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. When we choose to believe in the life and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, by faith, we are justified, considered worthy for that age, in other words. So it's a, it's a decision, it's a, it's a matter that we have to take part in. We don't earn our way to that age. There's no amount of being good. If we're just good enough, we'll get to that age. It's about finding our way there through Jesus Christ. So we have nothing to say about our interest into this age, but we do have something to do or to say about our interest into the second age. And Jesus says, of those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. So you could take Jesus' words and you could make the case if you want to, well, there'll be no marriage in heaven. Indeed, when most men and women get married today, in a Christian wedding, they exchange vows and make their commitments to one another. And generally, they end it with, until death do us part. It's the idea that I'm committing to this relationship, but at the point that you or I pass on, then our relationship has, has ended. So you could make that case, if you want to, that there's no marriage in heaven, but I also want you to see that in another sense, you could make a strong case that there, in fact, will be a marriage in heaven, but it will be an even greater kind of marriage than we can even begin to imagine today. You see, this is the truth. In heaven, we will all be one big family. We'll just be one large family. Family. When God created each of us, he gave us all our own DNA, our individual fingerprints and personality, skills and, and abilities. And he gave us a family to belong to. Just because we will leave this world as we know it today and enter into the next age, the eternity, does not mean that we have to believe we lose all of that. When we die, we will not keep our material things, but we will keep our relationships. We don't cease to exist here completely in such a way that, that we can now begin to exist somewhere else, but we move on. 
to another place. There's no reason to believe that our relationships on this earth will suddenly just disappear. Therefore, I believe that husbands and wives will still know one another in eternity. I believe parents and children will still know each other in eternity, but in a way that we're not even currently experiencing or can really even truly fathom completely. Instead of individual families, we will be one large family. We'll be God's family. Let me see if I can explain it this way. Let's look at what Jesus said in verse 36. And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. Let's break that down this way. In heaven, the purposes of marriage will be fulfilled. One of those is procreation. He, Jesus said, and they can no longer die. You see, without procreation, without man and woman having children, humanity would have died out a long time ago. But in heaven, there is no more death. There is no need for there to be continued births in order to maintain humanity. The second is companionship. Jesus said they are God's children. When God gave Eve to Adam, he did so so she would be a companion or a helper to him. Today, we are many families, but in heaven, like I've already said, we will be one large family, and we'll all be, we'll be related to one another. We, we, already, we already have um, symbols of that already in our minds and our thoughts because we typically refer to one another as a brother or sister in Christ, and that's what we'll be in heaven. We will all be brothers and sisters. I, I, don't, I can't explain it. You, you might be thinking, well, will I, will I be the big brother or little brother? I don't know. But we will be brothers and sisters. So there'll be that this idea of companionship that God has given us as marriage for now will no longer be needed there because there'll be a, a relationship that we experience with one another that just totally just takes that to a whole new level. And then third is reflect the gospel. Jesus says, since they are children of the resurrection. Now, typically today when you attend a wedding, you, you, you see the, the groom and the bride have gone to great lengths to dress up, to make themselves look good, get their hair done, wear certain makeup, and, and, and present themselves in a certain way. And typically you're sitting in a service and sometimes you're thinking, man, they just look perfect. Well, we know the truth. They're, they're not perfect. We take pictures while they look that way, but we know we know they're, they're not perfect. But what, and, and, and therefore that doesn't reflect the gospel. It's not the image you see in the ceremony that reflects the gospel, but it's the love and it's the sacrifice that both have to bring into the relationship that reflects the gospel. The greater reality of the gospel is presented in the picture of marriage. As a husband loves his wife, as Christ loves the church, Paul says. And as a woman loves her husband by submitting to him, and the two of them become this beautiful image, this reflection of the gospel that Jesus has brought into this world. And that's what Paul is referring to in his letter to the believers in Ephesus in Ephesians 5. He says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. He says, This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. You see, the, the union or the connection, the marriage that takes place between a husband and wife in, in this world reflects the eternal union that takes place between an individual and Christ, the gospel. Let me read what Ray Ortland in his book entitled Marriage and the Mystery of the Gospel. He says, why do people feel the stirrings of romance and start spending time together and take language? long walks hand in hand and long for one another when apart and write poetry and sing along to our song and fall so head over heels in love that they finally jump 
into the mega commitment of marriage. There is a reason for this very human experience. And the reason is not only what God did back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, but also, and even more, what God has done in uniting Christ and his church. The eternal romance, the eternal love story, is why God created the universe and why God gave us marriage in Eden and why couples fall in love and get married in the world today. Every time a bride and groom stand there and take their vows, they are reenacting the biblical story whether they realize it or not. So it's not that there will be no more marriage in heaven, but that there will be this one large marriage between Christ and his bride, the church. Everyone who is considered worthy to take part in that age will be a part of this large family. Randy Alcorn in his book, entitled Heaven, says, The one flesh marital union we know on earth is a signpost pointing to our relationship with Christ as our bridegroom. Once we reach the destination, the signpost becomes unnecessary. That one marriage, our marriage to Christ, will be so completely satisfying that even the most wonderful earthly marriage couldn't be as fulfilling. We will love each other in a way that we cannot possibly begin to imagine today. My wife and I will tell you that when we got married 34 years ago, we were truly in love. But we have noticed at different times, different seasons, that somehow without seemingly without any effort on our part, our love has grown deeper. We simply love each other today way more than we ever did in those days. As hard as that is to imagine, in the future, eternity, there will be a love between us while it's matched by the love we have with others as well, will be something that's just hard for us to fathom. It's because of Christ. It's because of our relationship with him. So life in the next age does not have to cause us to think that it erases life in this age. Instead, it... It greatly improves it. It fulfills it. Indeed, life today is a preparation for life eternal. Now, I want to pause for a moment and address something because I can imagine that in the room of this size and those who are perhaps are watching from home as well might be thinking right now of, of a particular kind of broken heart that you have experienced in days past. And perhaps even at the expense of of a family member, somebody that has caused you pain. And you perhaps might be thinking, if they are going to be in heaven too, I'm not having that kind of relationship with them. And I'm telling you, if you're considered worthy and that person considered worthy, then you will have that kind of relationship there. But I want you to hear this. The pain that you have carried in your heart for so long will not be there. I even submit to you that the memory of the pain will not even be there. How could it possibly be if heaven is supposed to be a, a wonderful and a happy place? Suzanne and I have a friend that we've stayed in in close um, contact with over the years, all the way back to seminary days. Sadly, she suffered a, a, a time of divorce because of a, of a husband who became incredibly violent after having gone to war and come back. And she, she's 
the, the relationship had to end. She basically had fled the relationship for her life. I don't remember how many years ago, but it's been a long time now. But just this week in talking to her, she brought up in our conversation the fear that she still has today. Apparently, recently, her former husband has inherited a sum of money. And what she, comment she made was she fears that he now has the money and the resources to hurt her. I just thought, all these years, how tragic that a person would have to live with such fear and such pain. And that is the reality, sadly, that so many people are experiencing today. But what a joy it was to be able to share with her that one day that will come to an end. Even the memory that haunts her today, I believe, will not haunt her in eternity. One day Jesus was teaching a crowd of people. There were so many people inside the house that, that when his family showed up to get a message to him, they, they couldn't even get to him. Look what Scripture says in Luke chapter 8. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Jesus was saying, there is a greater family to belong to, a family that transcends biological ties, an eternal family. Brothers and sisters in God's family. If you're in God's family today, if you're considered worthy of that age, then you are invited to the largest family reunion in the history of mankind. And it won't be one of those awkward family reunions that some of us experience in this life. You know, when you get there and there's that tension in between you and some other family members because of some bad history. Or like me, you're like meeting somebody as a cousin, you're like, I didn't know we were related. And if that's not good enough, I got some really good news for some of you in this room this morning. At that family reunion, you will not have to sit at the kids' table. You will be able to sit at Jesus' table with all the big people, enjoying that feast that he provides for us. Oh, just let that picture, that image, let it, let it just flow into your mind and thoughts. Let it just take captive so much of what you're experiencing today. Not only did Jesus obliterate the Sadducees' question, but he also confronts them on their misunderstanding of scriptures. Remember, they were considered to be experts, but yet they knew so little, it seems. G uh, Luke doesn't record this, but Mark's gospel shows that Jesus said, are you not an heir because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? So here he was telling these people who proclaim themselves to be experts, that you got it wrong. You don't know everything in scripture. You have so much more to learn. Look what he said in verse 37. He even uses the very scripture that they prescribe their lives to to be able to show what he's pointing to. Verse 37, but in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise. For he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For to him all are alive. Here's Jesus quoting from the Torah, as they called it, the Old Testament, those first five books, and he is showing that resurrection is, in fact, taught in Scripture. You see, this quote comes from Moses' experience of the, the burning bush. Many of you in this room are very familiar with that story, where God spoke through a burning bush and called him, commissioned him into service. Well, those Sadducees would have been very familiar with that story as well. And Jesus quotes that verse that says, I am the God of your father. 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Jesus speaks that quote that which is spoken in the present tense, I am, that only makes sense if Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were still around somewhere, still living, in other words. With all this on my thoughts this week, I was at a funeral service and overheard an individual walk up to one of the family members and, and said, I was a friend of your brother. I've heard that so many times or some variation of that so many times. I, I guess I really haven't thought about it in this way, but that person was speaking past tense because we're thinking the person is no longer here with us and we no longer have the ongoing relationship we had, so that's kind of how we typically would refer to that. I, I used to be, I once was, but that's not the words that are being quoted here. That's why God's words here are so revealing to us. He said, I am, which means that he is declaring Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still to be existing, and he still proclaims to have an ongoing relationship with them. So let's be clear about this. God is the God of the living, and therefore, resurrection is a reality. Scripture speaks to that. Jesus could have also taken these same experts into the Torah and referred back to Genesis, the creation, when God created man and breathed life into man, into man as being the first proto Resurrection. In other words, the first example, the first moment of which, which God breathed life into that which did not have breath. He could have taken to the experience of Enoch who was walking with God and suddenly Enoch was no longer there. He didn't die, he just simply went into the, that age with God. He could have spoken to Abraham who while his very son was on the altar of sacrifice believed God could raise the dead. So indeed, the Old Testament speaks of resurrection. But not only that, the New Testament speaks of it. For example, in Luke chapter 5, we saw, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. And Jesus himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. I could continue on for quite some time. Indeed, there is plenty of scriptural evidence to support that the resurrection is real. The scribes did not want to hear it. They didn't want to receive it. And sadly, that's what we oftentimes do with Scripture still today. When there's something in the Word of God that we don't want to receive, if there's a command or a responsibility of which we're to accept, if we don't want it, then we will ignore it. We will read the passage. We will even read the specific verse over and over again throughout our lives, all the while ignoring what God is speaking to us right then and there. We just have that ability as human beings to, to sort of throw up the hand to God and say, nope, I'm not going there. And that's what they were doing, and Jesus confronts them with their wrong thinking. I want to ask our worship team to come on up. I want to close with this. If there is no resurrection, then what would be the purpose of a, a new covenant? or a new heart, or, or a new life that Scripture speaks about. If there is no resurrection, then why would Jesus have died? Do you see how Jesus is a new kind of king? Because what kind of king would willingly die in order for his subjects to be able to live? And not just any subjects, but the very subjects who would reject him and cry out for his death. What kind of king can offer eternal life? Only one. And his name is Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
It is through his life and death and resurrection that we can be considered worthy of that age, eternity. But as I said earlier, we had nothing to say about coming into this age, but we do have something to say about the next age. And it does require a response from us. us. There's nothing we can do to be good enough to earn our way there. We just simply get there by faith in Jesus Christ. And so we invite you this morning, if you're sitting here today and you're, you don't know if you're considered worthy, if you don't know where you stand with God, we would love the opportunity to talk with you and pray with you about that, help you with that. We believe it's crucial. It's the most important thing for you to give a consideration to this day. So what I want to do this morning, in just a moment, we'll stand and be singing the song. And I just want to invite everyone to take this opportunity to respond to God. You can do that by worshiping in the song that's being sung. But you also may just want to take some time and just spend praying with God and just specifically saying, God, thank you that resurrection is real. And if you feel confident in that, you thank him that you're a part of that next age to come. But if you're not sure, then you take a few moments and you just begin to pray and even take some time to be quiet and listen to him. See if he may be speaking to you this morning. He may want you this day to become a member of his family, that you become our brother and our sister in God's family this day. If you'd like to talk with somebody, we'll be up here during the invitation. You can come up. You can pray at the altar if you want to. You can pray with one of us or just talk with us. We'll be happy to help you in any way or even after the service. Whatever's most comfortable for you, but just don't ignore this. We invite you this day to become a member of God's family. Would you stand this morning as we sing? We invite you to respond.